on World News Tonight. Engulfed in smog, world's most toxic air forces India's capital to shut schools. Race to escape, foreigners escape Gaza as Israeli Hamas violence escalates. On alert, Storm Sierra brings chaos to Western Europe causing unparalleled damages. And hop on the bus. Dogs enjoy rides in a special bus created for dogs by a dog This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Friday night. We begin tonight's coverage in the smog-ridden streets of India. People in New Delhi woke up to a thick layer of toxic haze today and some schools were ordered to be shut for two days as the air quality index entered the severe category in several parts of the Indian capital. Authorities in the Indian capital Delhi have shut all primary schools for two days amid worsening levels of air pollution. Residents complained of irritation in the eyes and itchy throats with the air turning a dense grey as the AQI hovered around 480 in some monitoring stations in the city. An AQI of 0 to 50 is considered good, while anything between 400 to 500 affects healthy people and is a danger to those with existing diseases. Scientists say that the air quality is expected to deteriorate further in the next two weeks. Delhi's Environment Minister has called an emergency meeting to review the situation. Delhi is one of the world's most polluted cities. Delhi's air turns specially toxic in winter due to various factors, including burning of crop remains by farmers, low wind speeds and bursting of firecrackers during festivals. Studies by the Delhi Pollution Control Committee showed that the city's air pollution peaks from 1st to 15th of November when the number of stubble burning incidents in the neighbouring states of Punjab and Haryana increase. According to government data, the concentration of PM2.5, fine articulate matter that can clog lungs and cause a host of diseases, exceeded the safe limit of 60 micrograms per cubic meter by 7 to 8 times in several parts of the city and its suburbs. Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejirwal soon announced that all government and private primary schools in the city would remain closed on Friday and Saturday. As part of the third phase of its Graded Response Action Plan to combat effects of increased pollution, a central pollution control panel ordered an immediate ban on non-essential construction work in the city. In the second phase implemented last week, all public transport services, including the Delhi Metro and electric bus services, had been instructed to increase their frequency to curb vehicle emissions. Last month, the Delhi government put in place a comprehensive ban on the manufacture sale and use of firecrackers within the city. The practice has been in place for the last three years. Polluted air causes severe health issues to Delhi residents every year. Health professionals are reporting increasing cases of asthma and lung issues among children and the elderly because of the worsening air quality. Jagal Kishore, the head of the medicine department at the city's Safdarjang Hospital, told local media that the hospital was recording a surge in the number of irritative bronchitis infections. He recommended people suffering from respiratory issues not go out in the open unless absolutely necessary. Thousands of people swamped Pakistan's main northwestern border crossing, seeking to cross into Afghanistan a day after the government's deadline expired for undocumented foreigners to leave or face expulsion. The deadline for them to leave Pakistan has come and gone. Security forces are detaining thousands of Afghans seeking refuge in the country and holding them in centres before they're deported. We've started the operation and we're collecting people's data. Most of them had already voluntarily gone to Afghanistan and their houses were empty. We took 450 people into custody and we'll be taking more action. More than 13,000 people who have been identified are to be processed and that's our phase one. Since Wednesday, holding centres have been filling up and many have been deploring poor conditions, including little to no access to water. Huge queues have also been forming at the border as thousands voluntarily make their way back to Afghanistan. But many of these Afghans have been living in Pakistan for decades and say they have nothing to go back to. 
They've suddenly come up with the idea of expelling us. I've been living in Pakistan for 22 years. I was born here. I grew up here. I'm a tailor. I have my own shop. I'm doing well here. It's chaotic. They want us to leave. What are we going to do there? It will be very cold there. There will be no work there. What will we do there? Pakistan is home to more than 4 million Afghan migrants and refugees. An estimated 600,000 of those poured into the country after the Taliban seized power in August 2021. The Pakistani government says the deportations are a way of protecting the country's, quote, welfare and security after a rise in attacks that it blames on Afghan militants. But human rights groups, including Amnesty International, have been urging Pakistan to reverse the decision, saying the country must meet its international legal obligations and put an end to the crackdown. Over in Bangladesh now, thousands of Bangladeshi garment factory workers have again taken to the streets. They continue to demand better wages and voice frustration with higher rent and bills. Violent scenes on the streets of Dhaka as garment workers protest. Riot police fired rubber bullets, tear gas and sound grenades at nearly 5,000 demonstrators blockading a road and demanding an increase in wages. After working for 10 years, my salary is still at $96. If I add my attendance bonus, it goes up to 100. How can I survive with a wife and a child with this inflation? I need to get a loan every month as my salary isn't enough to feed my family. We make expensive clothes. The clothes then get sold at higher prices when they're exported overseas. The factory owners make good money, but our wages don't increase according to the money they make. What's the problem with the owners paying us higher wages if they can sell the clothes at higher prices? Bangladesh is home to around 3,500 garment factories which employ 4 million workers. Global brands like H&M, Gap and Levi's manufacture clothes in the country, but conditions are dire. A factory owners association is now offering unions a 25% wage increase, but workers say it isn't enough. They want their salaries hiked to $200 a month. Moving on to Israel Hamas war updates following the humanitarian breakthrough at the Rafah crossing. More foreigners and injured Palestinians crossed into Egypt on the second day of Rafah's opening. On the second day of the Rafah crossing reopening on Thursday, 344 foreign nationals and all citizens as well as dozens of severely injured Palestinians passed through the Egypt-Gaza border. The Rafah crossing is the only Gaza border crossing that isn't under Israeli control and is a crucial gateway for humanitarian support. So, um, we finally got the chance to almost leave Gaza. This is my fifth attempt to leave. Thursday's crossings followed the at least 361 foreign nationals and 76 injured Palestinians who were able to cross into Egypt on Wednesday. The Egyptian government said it plans to help evacuate around 7,000 foreigners and dual nationals from the Gaza Strip without providing a specific timeline. Among those crossing the border on Thursday were a South Korean family. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, the family of five, who were the only South Koreans living in the Gaza Strip, were safely evacuated to Egypt on Thursday. I have a Korean nationality and we live in Gaza. Thank God, today, we left Gaza to Egypt. Thankfully, we left behind the war, the situation, but our family and relatives are still in Gaza. The ministry said the family arrived in Egypt at around 11.15 a.m. local time and they are being provided with consular assistance, including accommodation and medical checkups. Meanwhile, a Japanese aircraft bringing 15 South Koreans and one foreign national family member departed Tel Aviv for Tokyo on Thursday along with Japanese nationals. It is the second flight Japan is providing to South Korea, following the offering of 20 seats last month. This is seen as returning the favor after Seoul brought back some 50 Japanese nationals along with South Koreans from Israel on October 14. With this, there are 420 South Korean citizens remaining in Israel. 
Storm Kieran smashed into northwestern Europe with strong winds and driving rain. It killed one person in France and one in Spain. And another person was killed in Italy as schools, airports and trains halted service. Winds over 120 miles per hour, widespread flooding and driving rain. Storm Kieran smashed into northwestern Europe on Thursday, uprooting trees and destroying homes. The Channel Islands have, so far, been one of the worst affected areas, but storm-related deaths have been reported in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and as far south as Spain. Schools have been forced to close, as well as airports, rail and ferry services across vast swathes of Europe. Stay-at-home orders have been widely issued. In France, over a million households have been left without electricity. And in Brittany, in the northwest, gale force winds led to reports of 66 foot waves off the coast. In the northern city of Lille, Abdel was trying to return to Paris by train. It's worrying, but I'm not worried that the wind is going to blow me away or that a lamppost is going to fall on top of me. I'm not talking about myself. We're a group of individuals living on this planet, and the most worrying thing is not what we're living through right now. The wind is trying to blow me away, but what's troubling is what's still to come and our children's future. While the storm is primarily affecting northwestern Europe, one woman was killed and the weather has caused several injuries in Spain, where the state-run weather agency also issued red warnings for two of its northern regions. Storm Kiron, which follows on the heels of deadly storm Babette two weeks ago, was driven by a powerful jet stream that swept in from the Atlantic. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And the latest on the road to the White House now. Vivek Ramaswamy and Representative Ro Khanna sat under hot stage lights and the gaze of half a dozen TV cameras clad in near-matching navy blue suits and clashing over foreign policy and nuclear power. It was a no-stakes debate between a long-shot Republican presidential contender and a California congressman who isn't even running for the White House. Except that in the doldrums of 2024, such sideshows are taking center stage. Later this month, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will spar with California's Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom, also not a presidential candidate, in a highly anticipated Fox News forum. For Republicans gasping for oxygen in a primary dominated by Donald Trump, these stare-downs are a cry for attention. For Democrats, they may offer a jump start on the next presidential election. And for both parties, they are an acknowledgement of how preordained this primary appears. A campaign so flat that politicians are making their own entertainment and perhaps setting the stage for 2028. Now, next in the U.S., Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. testified in the New York civil fraud trial where they are co-defendants along with their father. Both denied involvement in the financial statements, which the Attorney General Letitia James said to have exaggerated the assets of the Trump organization. For a second straight day, the Trump sons back in court. Eric Trump appearing combative at times under questioning by the New York Attorney General's office, accused, along with his brother and father, of exaggerating assets on the Trump organization's books to get better interest rates on loans. Eric testifying he ran the day-to-day -day operations of the Trump organization while his father was in office, but denied having anything to do with the disputed financial statements submitted to banks and lenders, saying, I pour concrete echoing his deposition testimony. I pour concrete. I operate properties. I don't think I've ever had any involvement in the statement of financial condition, to the best of my knowledge. But the state points to emails indicating Eric's involvement and Eric's signature on letters that declared the annual financial statements free of misstatements and fraud. These letters, a critical piece of evidence, also bearing the signature of his older brother. Don Jr. again telling the judge today he relied on accountants to compile the financial statements. You pay experts millions of dollars to be experts. You sign off on what they give you and you're liable. If this was to become precedent where you could have an overzealous attorney general go after any business in New York, 
uh, this city would be in even worse shape than it already is today. Over in the UK, speaking after the UK's first AI safety summit, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said that people should not be worried about the impact of AI on jobs because education reforms would boost skills. The summit was attended by leading world leaders, including the tech mogul Elon Musk. Like-minded governments and AI companies have today reached a landmark agreement. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on Thursday hailed an agreement between leading AI developers and governments to test new artificial intelligence models before they are released. He said the accord on the final day of his two-day AI safety summit would help to manage the risks of the rapidly developing technology and protect humanity from the potential threat it poses. The late Stephen Hawking once said, AI is likely to be the best or worst thing to happen to humanity. If we can sustain the collaboration that we have fostered over these last two days, I profoundly believe that we can make it the best. Because safely harnessing this technology could eclipse anything we have ever known. The list of countries that had signed up to the safety testing collaboration did not include China, whose representatives were not included in the second day of talks. But the day prior, Sunak secured China's backing of the Bletchley Declaration, another international effort to manage the risks of AI. It wasn't an easy decision for you to invite China, and indeed lots of people criticized me for it. But I think it was a right long-term decision, because any serious conversation about AI safety has to engage the leading AI nations. Sunak welcomed U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to the second day of the AI summit as well as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. A conversation between Sunak and Elon Musk on the tech billionaire's X platform was to mark the final words on AI. According to two sources at the summit, Musk told fellow attendees on Wednesday that governments should not rush to roll out AI legislation. South Korea's military officials say that North Korea shipped some 2,000 containers of weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine. Also, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed concerns over Russia's withdrawal of its ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He calls it an irresponsibility that represents a significant step in the wrong direction. South Korea has also accused North Korea of shipping military equipment to Russia, following similar accusations recently made by the U.S. and Ukraine. A military official on Thursday said that it estimates a total of 2,000 containers have been shipped to Russia from North Korea's port city of Najin, close to the border with Russia. The official explained that the containers are capable of loading more than 200,000 rounds of 122mm artillery shells and over 1 million rounds of 152mm shells. Apart from rocket launchers, shells and artillery, the military also noted that there are indications of the transfer of short-range ballistic missiles. The official also noted that there have been indications of the North's supply of weapons to Russia even before Kim Jong-un visited Russia in September as their arms trade via sea has picked up pace since August. The military anticipates that in return for weapons, North Korea will likely gain Russia's assistance in satellite technology, potentially to prepare for its third attempt at launching a spy satellite. The North may also receive necessities like food and fuel to get through the upcoming winter. The two sides are also anticipated to discuss potential joint military exercises in the future. South Korea is calling for the immediate halt of the arms transfer, saying it is a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions and seriously threatens the peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula and the world. Welcome back. Russian drones hit civilian targets in Ukraine's Kharkiv. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a Russian drones hit civilian targets and triggered a fire today near Ukrainian's Kharkiv and the casualties are yet to be clarified. A wildfire raged yesterday near the coastal town of Gandia in the eastern Spanish region of Valencia, forcing the evacuation of at least 350 people. A former gang member charged in the 1996 murder of hip-hop star Tupac Shakur pleaded not guilty in the Las Vegas court. According to New Zealand's final election, the centre-right National Party needs support of both ACT New Zealand and NZ First Parties for government. A woman has been arrested after allegedly running onto tarmac at Canberra Airport, Australia in an apparent attempt to stop a flight from leaving without her.
And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again next week as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in Santa Catarina, Brazil, as dogs prove to stroll in style on their very own bus in the city of Florianopolis. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.